Hello, very beautiful community. I'm going to do something that a few of you want me to do, but I'm going to do it my way, which is to say our way. At least in the sense that I'm going to put us rather than the issue first, because I think that that's probably the whole point of us gathering here endlessly on the chat channel. So what we'll talk about is the press conference and the reaction to the press conference by Andrei Pivavarov from Open Russia, who you know less well of the three, Ilya Yashin, who you know a bit better, and Vladimir Karamurza, who you know even better because he's much better known in the West than in Russia. And we'll talk about their press conference and about the backlash against it without really talking about it. We'll just, in fact, pick out issues that it generated that we ourselves encounter in our democratic life at home and sort of reflect on that. We'll learn quite a bit, I think, about what would a, a genuinely politicized Russian opposition look like, sure. And we'll learn a little bit about how different interests that come to the table of politics don't need to sing from the same hymn sheet. Um, but still primarily be a conversation about us. Now, what's the context for this? Um, the context is that we have a scary situation in the West, and that's part of the reason I began my channels. We have a situation where some Western citizens want to give up on democratic institutions because they can't feel, touch, trust them anymore. And other citizens can feel touch and trust, but they have become profoundly depoliticized, caught up in moralized actions, expressions of political theater that don't any longer relate to serious questions like winning and getting power. So some people have got into a dynamic where inadvertently they're destroying their own democracies and we don't blame them for that. Other people are in a dynamic whereby they are just sleepwalking as their democracies slip through their fingers. Uh, citizens who have lost political efficacy, who have lost citizen efficacy because they're asleep, and they're not asleep through complete passivity like the Russian population. They're asleep through theatrical and unproductive engagement in politics, right? So they are not disengaged, but neurotically engaged, right? So it's a bit like the difference between me sitting here and um, instead of asking why am I so fat constructively and thinking, well, 17, 17 donuts per day, Vlad, I mean, come on versus unconstructively. Like, why am I so fat? 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 You see, the repetitive asking of the question itself precludes me from engaging with it properly. And a lot of our political engagement is itself neurotic in this way because we now favor purity of certain moral positions purity of certain stances because they reflect our identity rather than winning, rather than getting closer or further away from power or influencing those who have power so that they do more of what we want. So a misanthropic instinct in response to all of this is to say, well, I'm sorry, but if that's what these humans are really like, they deserve to lose their democracies. And we do love here instead of misanthropy. If our boats are sinking because we're oblivious to the fact that they're sinking and we're acting counterproductively as they're sinking, they don't, that don't mean that our boats deserve to sink, that we deserve to have them sunk. It means we need help. Um, it means we need reassurance. It means we need a little bit of shaking up, but also a lot of gentleness. Right? We don't need the misanthropic instinct that let's give up on all this and you know, move to Mars and start another civilization. The move to Mars idea anyway won't work 
not because most of you have come to dislike Elon Musk in the last couple of days, couple of years, but because Musk's idea of migrating life to other planets over the next hundred years is itself going to prove to be a fleeting utopia like the fleeting utopias of the 20th century it will die out so let's say now a little bit about the um, Russian opposition and what the kerfuffle is all about one of the tendencies that the Russian opposition has suffered from um, in my interpretation right I won't argue for this uh, here uh, because we're trying to focus on us not on on the Russian opposition most of you don't care about the Russian opposition and we need to acknowledge that you know one one percent of our viewers are Ukrainian half a percent are Russian here um, on the main channel that's a bigger number but here that's really a very small number you're very welcome of course but I'm sorry but we're talking about what you know Sweden New Zealand and uh, Canada needs now Over the last 10 plus years, and indeed earlier than that, there has been a tendency for opposition to Putin in Russia to migrate from the political realm to the realm of activism, protest, journalism, broadcasting, and moralism and sort of um, moralized advocacy making questions of power acquisition secondary and it's in that state of radical depoliticization that the russian opposition found itself as putin's full-scale invasion of ukraine began and it didn't just find itself in that position it also found itself trying to speak to a population that itself was profoundly depoliticized with most Russians not being either in favor or against the war but really being in favor of sort of outsourcing politics to the Kremlin and staying as best they can out of it so uh, depoliticized vanguard was left to deal with a massive depoliticized blob it was an extraordinarily unproductive uh, situation now I'm just going to assert this because I did watch 90% of this one and a half to two hour press conference. My experience of the press conference was that it was a presentation by moral authorities, by activists, by broadcasters, not by politicians. And one of the things that's been universally, near universally misunderstood, even the th but the thing that became really controversial about what these, what two of the three of them said, um, Piva Barov said it, Karamurza said it, Yashin didn't say it, he perhaps arguably partly implied it, but I didn't hear him say it, unless that occurred in the 5-10% of the whole thing that I missed, but I, I, I sincerely doubt that. Now, what happened was that um, they made an essentially moral claim, but in their depoliticized discourse, um, it came out as a political proposition, which just confused everybody. And that was that um, they were saying that ordinary Russians should be protected from the sanctions, which should be more directed against all the culprits behind the evils of the regime and the evils of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I watched this twice over just to make sure I registered the vibe. And the vibe was moral. It was really a moral distinction being made about culpability. I won't legislate on that myself with my own views in this video. You know what my views are about um, collective responsibility, responsibility by association. I believe in that, right? 
with Thomas Mann, I believe all Germans are responsible, all Russians are responsible. I do not believe in guilt, however, by association with Thomas Mann. I believe Germans are not guilty as a collective, Russians are not guilty, but they're responsible as a collective. <laughs> you get the story. There's a video about that on the main channel. Now, they made a moralized statement about culpability and then it ended up being dressed up in political terms you know let's sort of uh, try to weaken the sanctions that hit the um, uh, Russian population as a whole now this was taken entirely understandably as a political proposition but it wasn't it's a moral proposition. And that is something that I don't have strong emotions about because I'm a British citizen. The last time I lived on that territory, it was the Soviet Union. It was 1990. Um, so I have no civic emotions. I am more civically emotional about Denmark than I am about Russia. Um, I accept some cultural and psychological shaping of mine but by my history, nine years um, of childhood there in the Soviet Union. But civically, I'm sorry. I, and psychologically, indeed, I'm overwhelmingly Western European and somewhere between Western and Central European. I'm not East European, right? I find uh, East Europeans very different to me, indeed, and Russians even more different. So. But let, 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 let's try to nevertheless step into shoes, uh, the shoes of empathy here. If I were Russian, or rather if the same stuff was happening in Britain, despite the unimpeachable courage of these people, I would be beside myself at the absence of politics there. Because um, the problem wasn't that... Um, this was a bad political claim. There is no such thing as a bad political claim, uh, really. Um, because you need political competition, you need uh, constructive conflict in the opposition group so they can debate things with the world between themselves. So I have uh, no issue with them making political moves of various kind. I might reject the moves, but I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with, if I were to think of myself emotionally as a Russian, if, if I were a Russian citizen, um, or if this were happening in Britain, really, w my problem would be that this is they, they, they said a political thing without saying it politically. That's extraordinary. Or unextraordinary. It's unextraordinary if they're just broadcast as an activist. But if they're called the Russian opposition or political uh, figures, oppositional political figures, then this is unbelievable. Um, so what's missing then to, to, to make their claim political? Well, who's the claim addressed to? Not clear. Is it Westerners? Is it Russians? Okay, it's Russians, but which Russians? Not clear. Is it a, an audience of Russian expat oppositioners in the West? Maybe. What's going to be the reaction to, the predictable reaction to saying that? Who's going to come up with what reaction? How is the different set of reactions going to be beneficial to them, to, to the people's putting this proposal on the table, how are they going to react to these reactions? What change will occur as a result of them saying it? If they want some change, who's going to do that change and how and when and by what mechanisms and with what justifications? Right? So politics was missing. Morally, 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 Russians are not all culpable. That's what they were trying to say. And then they just sellotaped a political conclusion, right? We can sanctions. I mean, another political question missing. Can you even do that if you wanted to? What does it mean to weaken sanctions that affect Russian, ordinary Russians, but strengthen sanctions that affect the regime? I mean, how is anybody listening to them supposed to practically make that distinction? 
And why does it sound like that they're, they're, they're talking about um, sanctions as though the appropriateness or inappropriateness of sanctions is a matter of moral principle as opposed to a matter of political necessity? A lot of the sanctions on Russia um, are not effective. They strengthen the Putin regime. A lot of sanctions on Russia we're not doing. But it's more complex than that because sanctions are just a counter reaction. We've got to do something, so this is this is what we're doing. And there's other things we could do, but we're not doing them. Like other sanctions are helping Ukraine more. Well, we're not doing that, but we'll do this because that's what we can do. So that political context was missing. So right, a political proposal made radically in a radically depoliticized way. If they said um, we have this principle of trying to make life easier for ordinary Russians. It's very important to us and we believe it's going to be effective uh, for weakening the Putin regime anyway. Um, they, they could argue for that. There's no problem. They could even say, well, look, you know, helping ordinary Russians in this way would strengthen the Putin regime and make Putin stronger in the war and make Ukraine more likely to lose, but we still support it. Well, that's fine. That's a completely legitimate political position. It's just not one I'm going to share. But that's fine, because I'll just say, either it's none of my business, because it's the Russian opposition discussing it, and I'm worried about Keir Starmer, you know, you know, or Rishi Sunak, um, or the West, or NATO, or Ukraine maybe. Um, or if I make it to some extent my business, because I'm worried about Russia disrupting my European security arrangements here, then I could tell them where to go or that I don't like anything of what they're saying, but they're making a political claim and we can conflict about it, that's fine. But they're not doing that. They're making a, a, a moral distinction and sellotaping a little bit of politics onto it. Um, let's say briefly um, something about the, 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 the reactions to this. The reactions were very sort of um, negative from the pro-Ukrainian internet. And I've spent a lot of time on whatever that place is called now, X or Twitter, probably spent 30 minutes on there today. Um, a little bit interacting with people who were asking me questions about what the hell was going on. And a few people who I also know from YouTube were reacting negatively to what the Russian positioners were saying and the only advice I could really give is right back to where we started effective politics okay these are three people um, whose moral authority you're welcome to question if you like you can't question it entirely right because Karamurza was nearly twice um, uh, assassinated by Mr. Putin and he went ill to jail, knowing what to do not to go to jail. And to, just meant leaving, the, getting out of the country earlier on that on that stay. Um, you know, Ilya Yashin went to prison intentionally by telling the truth about um, Bucha. So obviously these people have moral authority. You can question how much because you don't like things they're saying. That's absolutely fine. But here is my response. If you're getting worked up about it. Um, people, these three people, don't owe you anything. They don't need you. You don't owe them anything and you don't need them. Nobody's asking you to move in with them. Nobody's asking you to marry them. Nobody is asking you to vote for them. You're only being asked, if you are me, let's say, a British citizen. Um, and it's the same, quite frankly, if you're a Ukrainian. You're only being asked two things. Um, or even one thing, we can put it together. Um, is this person 
a partial ally or not. That's to say I might not like them in this or that way, but take your political project, whatever it is, right? Ukraine's political project is something Ukraine is debating with itself, but it certainly means being um, independent and protected from um, maniacal imperial aggression, right? It means other things too. Um, so you could say, well, okay, are these Russian oppositional guys my allies partly or not? That's to say, let's imagine you categorize them as doing eight things politically or proposing eight things politically, write up the eight things, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What, you reject all eight? Then they're just not your ally. Might not be your enemy, nor your ally. What if you like three but dislike five? So they are an opponent on five, an ally on three, right? Some of the th three things they want is kind of, yeah, we can we can deal with that, right? Um, imagine they say, oh, we want Ukraine and NATO, and you say, well, I like Ukraine and NATO. I'm Ukrainian, so let's do it. Okay, we can be allies on that. But then you say some other stuff about sanctions on Russia. I don't share that. We're not allies on that. Um, same for me here in the West. I mean, I don't want Putin to nuke us. I don't want Putin uh, in, the, in his sort of quasi-alliance with the Chinese changing borders by force on my continent and deciding security arrangements on my continent. And I don't want my democracies to be undermined. Right? Are these Russian opposition folks allies of mine or not? Well, quite frankly, they're not significant on my political radar of concerns. Uh, but insofar as they're there, I could draw a little balance sheet and say, yeah, here are the two things and here are the other seven things, you know. Um, in my battle against depoliticization um, in the West, they might not be my allies because they're perpetuating it, but I could draw up a balance sheet. What would it look like if you were getting political stuff? Let's say something about this. If you were getting political stuff from Russian opposition that doesn't exist. And here you need to put aside your little um, sort of um, set of pre-prepared um, maneuvers, lists of points and slogans and so on because it's going to be a bit a bit like cold water coming over you it's going to be like stepping into the sea and then taking one extra step and then feeling a cold current of water right that that what that's what would what a seriously politicizing russian opposition would look like because they'd be saying things that aren't for us and that that are very much not about aligning with the kind of discourse that we would typically be engaging in. I'll model that a little bit to you. But let me just do one final thing on this theme of um, partial allies versus full allies versus not allies and versus sort of throwing the toys out of the pram where if somebody's only very partially our ally, we don't want to be their ally at all, right? I mean, what we really want to avoid is something like this, that... Um, Barry in Vancouver is crying and Susanna, Barry's wife, comes and says, Barry, what is what is the matter? What is happening? And he's saying, mm. <sighs> these people they have said things I don't like. <laughs> well, what, 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 what have they said? They have said things I, I don't like and, you know, I know that they are from a country I've never been to, and they're not very influential in that country, and aren't really influential at all out of that country either, and they really don't affect me much, but they've said things I don't like. Bar Barry, um, okay, I can see you, know, you, you overwhelmed, you're, you're vulnerable, but just, just take me maybe to the worst case scenario. What can happen here that makes you so morally invested? <gasps> YouTube and say things I don't agree with on, it on YouTube. They will do it on YouTube. <laughs> Honey, I, 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 I think 
I think we need to take it really gently with you. Um, you know, maybe we can, you know, think about just a few days off work, maybe to do some therapy as well. You know, we haven't been to your therapist for a long time, Barry. And, you know, you could just discuss with them that, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can't easily deal with um, other humans saying things you can't control and don't like. And, you know, maybe that's something you could take to the therapy session, darling. Oh, I don't. I mean, did God cre I mean, why did God? Because God created this whole thing and he, he just let it. He just allowed that people would say things that I don't like and he created a world like that. And that's not okay because only things I like should be said. Okay, honey, that's enough for today. Uh, enough politics for today. Western style politics, the 21st century, this is 21st century Western politics, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Right? So that's what we want to avoid. Um, and I'll say at the very end of our chat some principles about what we want to avoid. Uh, in particular, as Western citizens, not to become Barry, because Barry needs is very vulnerable. He needs a lot of support, and he's really not in a position to take initiative or own anything in his current state, and it's not good for his nervous system as well. Right. So I took literally about three minutes, and I, I don't want to be condescending here, to to paint a picture of literally three percent of what I would say if I were um, given the hat of being a Russian opposition that wants to overthrow Putin. This is an exercise in imagination for me. And um, we'll give a very quick Ukrainian response to that um, after. So the Russian population is completely normatively, and, and this is not about Russians or the Russian opposition, this is about us and effective political engagement. So this is just an illustration. Russians are completely normatively debilitated and they're scared of the future. You know, so I would say something to um, all Russians, right? Because, because what, what the just go briefly to what was said, um, the the message about weakening the sanctions wouldn't have landed well in Russia anyway as a political message from from these young men because most Russians would have thought, well, hang on, you you're just Western assets, you've sold out, you've betrayed the country, and now you're trying to help us. Nonsense. That's probably some kind of dodgy conspiracy. You're starting to get a NATO victory over us. Um, You're so scared and shut away that you can't see the future. You're scared to look ahead. But I'm here to tell you where we're going. And I'm here to make you unafraid to ask questions about that. As we move forward to a better future, we'll realize this is not just about us, it's about the whole world. The world's facing a lot of problems. Global security crises, climate crisis, migration, inequality. Any future country of ours worth its salt will make a leading and constructive contribution to this. Another point, but what's happened instead? The clown in the Kremlin has ruined your security. He's lined you up against a big alliance and you'll either lose to it, we'll either lose to it, because it's much bigger, or we'll sneak out a win you know, by Western democracies declining and so on. But that'll be even more disastrous for Russia. What am I going to do? I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you from NATO. Not by attacking NATO, but cooperating with NATO and with our neighbors. We won't win anything 
until we start respecting others and stop bullying our neighbors. Another point, Putin is doing internalized war. Right? He's asking you to look for enemies within. You could just say bullshit, bullshit to that, all Russians are included. Let me just give one trivial example of how you'd sort of begin translating the sort of stuff I've begun to put on the table that would be real politics um, in practice. And that's where the cold water comes over. I'm going to restore pride to the Russian army. The clown, illegitimate clown in the Kremlin, has destroyed you, the army, has destroyed you morally and physically by taking you into Ukraine. We need the Russophobic clown out of the Kremlin. Here is my 10-point charter for reforming the Russian army. This is what it's going to be like now to be in the Russian army. Yeah? When the future is shaped by the kind of vision I'm advancing. Dear Ukrainians, you know, I have something to say to you too. Um, what would, what would they say to Ukrainians? Well, what they would say, if they were political, is what nobody is saying, something that the West is not saying, something that the Ukraine is not saying, something that the Russian opposition is not saying, which is how do you um, reimagine the security of the ex-Soviet space? Um, and how do you conceive right, of Ukraine's fight for liberation as something broader than just a Ukrainian fight. See, if the West had a strategy, it would um, have a, a vision, right, of regional security, um, rather than the current situation where it has no policy to politicize the Russian space, doesn't think anything about Belarus in particular, and only has half a strategy to Ukraine, which is let's arm Ukraine a bit more, wait six months, arm Ukraine a bit more, and progressively that bit more decreasing as well. So, right, there'd be a vision for that space that the West would come in, and actually Ukraine and the Russian opposition would align with that. Um, Ukraine is not offering that vision. The Russian opposition are certainly not offering that vision. So it's an empty space. But a politicized Russian opposition would offer a vision um, of how uh, European security is construed that is inclusive of a constructively acting Russia. And they would do that in such a way as to instigate politicization in Russia. But you see um, how far removed this is, what I've just said, from anything you're ever going to hear from the Russian opposition. Right? And, but here it's also healthy for you to get out of your own sort of narcissistic bubble whereby you're shocked by a Russian opposition that doesn't exist, talking about you know, restoring the dignity of the Russian army, because um, your thought might be, well, let's just disband the Russian army and denuclearize Russia and break Russia up. Um, right? Pure, pure, purity, moralization, not real politics. Right? You could have real politics there. If Russia wasn't a nuclear power, you could conquer Russia. You could do an imperial move back on Russia, sure. But, and so have something, create something on that territory without asking the population who live there what they want um, but that's not a starter because Russia is a nuclear power um, so you know it, it, we're going to be stuck with that we're going to be stuck uh, whether we like it or not with dealing with Russia's security needs Ukrainian response okay dudes well we don't we don't give a stuff about all that stuff talking about the Russian army. I mean, this is the army that is um, doing massacres, doing apartheid, destroying our country. We don't give a hoot about all this babble about what you're going to have in the future and blah, 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 blah. But here's what we care uh, about. 
we want more uh, Western support. Um, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for us? Right? Could you do something for us? Right? And if you have something to, to ask in response, you know, maybe we could, we, could, we could negotiate. Maybe you ask us to sort of inflect our discourse a little bit. Sure. Um, maybe you could ask us to engage more with the Belarusian opposition. Right? Sure. Yeah, could be. Um, you know, we also like NATO. You know, do you support us joining in NATO? If you do, can you make a strong case for that? Um, and these seven things you've said we really don't like, so we're not going to be allies with you on that. You know, so right, you, the stuff I've just given you, the fake sort of speech um, of a Russian opposition, Ukraine doesn't need to buy any of that. Ukraine needs to say. Yes, nobody's asking us to marry that stuff or vote for that stuff. It's more, um, is this a political project that we can make use of because it partly overlaps with what we're after, or is it not? And if it's not, it's not. If it is, it is. If it's a bit of both, it's a bit of both, and that's it. And again, us in the West, we're interested in security, not being controlled by Russia and China, not being redefined by Russia and China. We're interested in... Um, democracy, and we're interested in no World War Three. So, out of all of this meanderization, what are our takeaways? They're quite obvious, but I'm just going to repeat them in order. First of all, minimization of identity politics. Identity politics is this five hyper identity politics is this five step move. We we'll take a political position. We make that political position morally be all and end all, as opposed to something we're just pushing for politically. It's not at the core of our moral identity. So we move from the political to the moral. We move from the moral to identity. It's who I am. It's who I am. An attack on my political position is an attack on who I am. Rather than, well, it's some Russian opposition opposition figures saying something. They don't matter much anyway at the moment. And really, the only question for me is, can I ally with them to some extent or not? And if I'm not, then getting on with my day. If yes, then I do a bit, right? So the political becomes the moral, the moral becomes identity. Then you also push for institutions to adopt your identity, number four. And five, you push for institutions to propagate your identity to others who don't yet have it. We want less of that, and we want more Ex exclusively political passions, political passions that are more independent of our identity and our moral core, right? Not completely attached from them, but not completely absorbed by them either. Here are some more principles that the Russian opposition panel on the whole um, was profoundly devoid of, that we need Right? We don't want to be like them in our politics. So what do we need? Now, we want to be like them in some ways in terms of the extraordinary courage and commitment they've shown. But in these particular political ways, we don't want to be like them. We want to understand that statements about politics are themselves political acts. You can't just go around doing proclamations of moral principle. They are themselves political acts, themselves with consequences. And you saw this largely moral extrapolation of a distinction between the guilty and the non-guilty that th these Russian oppositionals tried end up in a minor sort of international kerfuffle for them. We want cause and effect thinking. We don't want magical thinking, right? We want to make everything good or Heavens forbid, we're going to make America great again. So thinking about politics in a causal way means um, who's going to do what and how and when and by what mechanisms is, is what we're saying, what we're doing, bringing that closer or further away. We don't want to relate, and this is what I saw endlessly on Twitter to, today, to um, political events and political projects like consumers. Like you walk into a candy store, you buy the candy, and the candy is yours. You paid for the candy and it's now yours and it's the candy that you have because it's the candy that you want because it's the candy that you chose. Um, these Russian opposition figures are not candy because politics is not shopping on Amazon for goodness sake. 
they are simply people engaged in a certain kind of political project which you can ally with or not ally with by politically asking what's in it for me can i get something out of this not in the self-serving or consumerist sense but is the political project i am committed to in a position to constructively interact with that political project or it, if it's not it's not and that's fine too that's politics right nobody's asking us to vote for these people let alone have them move in with us or um you know uh marry us another point you don't understand politics if you start your political understanding by reflecting on what is good and right the ethical is one consideration in politics among others but only one among others it can't disappear too much because then you have terrible politics but it can't dominate too much because then you have um an apolitical way of engaging with politics. Good is not self-realizing. Saying the right thing over and over doesn't make it more likely to come about. And truth is not self-realizing. Um, the social power of a proposition, of a claim, does not increase in virtue of it being true. Right? If you are living in some kind of authoritarian regime, for example, the fact that what you're saying is true isn't going to increase the chances of your proposition winning out. If anything, it may work out the other way around for you. The fact that what you're saying is true may mean you get taken away, may mean you, you lose by telling the truth, right? So this point about the social power of truth remaining, the social power of reason, if you like, the social power of things you say remaining the same um, whether what you're saying is true or not. And this point about um, you saying the morally right thing not necessarily being something that makes that thing more likely to come about, that's very important as a, in, an understanding in politics because um, it helps you not slide into this world of um, narcissistic purity which detaches you from basic questions of how do we win, right? Um, it's no good if you win certain wars on college campuses or you win them on Twitter, but you end up two ter with two terms of Donald Trump. That's not winning, right? If you believe in, for example, the rights of disadvantaged people, but the way you advocate for them is conducive to Trump winning twice, that's not that's not successful politics. That's defeat. Um, so simply repeating the right thing all the time um, isn't helpful as a political strategy. A political strategy is all about power. Why did I just appeal to um, in my fake hat as a politicized, politicized Russian opposition, why did I appeal to the security services in the military? Because the basic, the first political principle, the first political question is how do you bring it about that people don't go around um, destroying each other? How do you bring it about that you have order instead of anarchy. That's the first political question that Thomas Hobbes starts with. He remains the greatest theorist of the modern state. Now, his particular answers were quite authoritarian, and we can disregard them today because we have the empirical evidence that we can gain stability by much more benign means. But that's the first political question. How do you bring about order and stop people from physically fighting with each other and destroying each other. And that question is nowhere to be seen in the um, discourse of the Russian opposition, as is the question about acquisition and transformation of power. 
right? And what we want with our discourse and our democracies is to be serious about the most basic political questions and whether we are drifting in a more constructive direction or a less constructive direction in the way that we're relating to them, right? We don't want to look neater and tidier and better with our little in-group at the expense of losing more and more to people who want to cancel um, the instantiation of our values, of our rights, um, of the political rituals and principles of democracy that we're passionate about. So this was a constructive, not very well prepared and very chaotic, but a constructive exercise in how not to be politically so that we can be ourselves more effective forgetting about Russia and the Russian opposition. What's the level?